Good morning. Good to see all of you this morning. Well, welcome to God's story. That's where we've been. It's God's story, and you're all a part of that story. I hope you know that. And as we walk through this, um, uh, for me, it's just been an incredible journey, and we're not very far into it, but I, I realize that we're all part of this story, and it depends on the decision, decisions that I make and you make as to what role we'll exactly play in it. I realized that once I heard about this that maybe some of you are kind of sitting on the fence and welcome to those that are joining us through the camera, through the airwaves, and maybe you too. Some people are on the fence and they kind of look at uh, over here to the west at these crazy Christians saying, I'm not sure about those people. But then they look to the east over here and they, they see those that just have, want nothing to do with God and deny God and they say, well, I'm not sure they have it right either. So here I sit on the fence. I'm sorry to tell you the day's going to come when you can't sit on the fence anymore. And I'm sorry to tell you that when that day comes and Satan comes along and he sees you sitting on the fence and he's going to say, come, come with me. And you're going to say, no, 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 Satan, I'm, I'm not sure I want to go over that way. I'm not sure you have it right. And he says, well, I need to tell you, the fence is mine. Because if you're not for God, you're against him, period. So as we walk this journey, you know, we just saying we live for you. Jesus, a name above every other name. We live for you. Open our eyes and wonder and show me who you are. And I will build my life upon your love because this is a firm foundation. That's what we just sang. And it's been a burden for me that since June, since we started this journey, that we're trying to establish this very thing, a firm foundation, and we're going back to the basics. And we started in Genesis, didn't we? And that God chose to give us his living word as the tool in which to know how to live. Now, he could have done it any other way. He didn't have to choose words, but that's what he chose. And he chose to give it to us in a way that he's laid it out, 66 books of the Bible. 1,800 chapters, just shy of about 800,000 words, something of that nature. Big book. And that's what God chose to give us. So I said, well, God chose to give it to this way. Then why don't we just start in the beginning and see how it unfolds? First Peter tells us that there is no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men were moved by God by the Holy Spirit, and spoke from God. So I believe, and I think a lot of you may believe, that this word is the infallible word of God. That the whole thing is true, that it has an answer to every issue of life. So I've committed to go through the scripture as God presented it to us sequentially. And the goal is to get the whole counsel of God, not just the bits and pieces I like <laughs> that kind of go with my life. But see it as he wants to build on it, hoping that I would get a better understanding of his foundation for my life, because that's what I seek. And I hope you do too. Well, Pat Barrett, who wrote that song that we just sang, says, well, here's why said, you know, life rarely behaves with our plans. You ever notice that? We have these plans, then they change. <laughs> he said, usually with uncertainty and not knowing the future, it comes with trials. And when this happens, it reveals, it magnifies, it displays, it shows what we have been standing on the whole time. God says in the scripture, Aaron, it's not, oh, maybe it is. I'm sorry. I'm looking at that one back there. I didn't realize I was giving you the whole slideshow. Luke 6. Luke 6. 
Dr. Luke was telling about how a man who built his house upon the rock. He laid this foundation of rock and brick, and when a flood occurred, when disappointments came, when things were disrupted, plans were disrupted, when unseen physical issues happened, when emotional struggles and relational misunderstandings come about, when the torrent, the fast-moving, strong wind came, the house stood firm. Why? Because it had been built on a solid foundation. And that's where I want to get us there, to the guy stretching out his arms on the rock, regardless of the storms that come. So we're building on a foundation, one brick at a time, gang, and as God wrote it. And the greater, Matt Chandler said, the greater your knowledge of the goodness and grace of God on your life, the more likely you are to praise him in a storm. So storms will come. hate to tell you that. Storms will come. Well, we're headed into the book of Leviticus. And uh, I realize this, a couple things. Leviticus, manual. Actually, it's also in Latin, the Levites, which is the descendants of Levi, one of the sons of Jacob. Um, it's possible that there's some in this room that have never read the book of Leviticus. And I get it. Every time I go through the Bible and I get to Leviticus, I just read through it. They think, we think, well, the things in Leviticus aren't relevant for today. They don't matter. It has nothing to do with my life, all those silly sacrifices. Well, what Leviticus I found, and I didn't know what I was going to do with Leviticus, and that's the challenge of taking the script as it comes. So I started with the beginning. I'm thinking, well, okay, Randy, well, the first thing to do is to read it and slow down and and I realized, well, it's just a continuation of Exodus. It's Moses uh, giving the words that were given to him from God on Mount Sinai to the people. A continuation of Exodus. That's what it is. And we can get somewhat of a good picture of Leviticus if you just look at the very first verse. Then the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, then he gets into the whole script, and then we can look at the last verse. Leviticus 27, 34. And it says, These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the sons of Israel, Mount Sinai. So there you go. There's the bookends of Leviticus. And then we're going to talk about what's in between for a couple minutes. Commandments. If you remember, we've talked about that. Misbah, to give, to give charge, to ordain, to appoint. It's a code of wisdom. That's what commandments are. I want to get us in gear on this. And then laws. Well, it's if it's laws, it makes us smarter. That's what it says. H-O-Q is the word. Ordinance, boundaries, conditions, law. I think I've shared that before, and it's been an interesting thing when I look at my past. I had, uh, as a kid, I had life with no boundaries. Not a healthy thing. God realized that with the people when he brought them out of Egypt. They're like, they need boundaries. We talked about that. They don't know how to live. They don't know how to live with me. They've been slaves. And we talked about that, told what to do, what to do, what to do, what to do. So these are the commands. Here's what I learned. Leviticus is called the grace of the gospel in the Old Testament. Like, wow. It speaks of ideas and concepts that ultimately are fulfilled in Jesus 1,500 years later. Leviticus talks about Jesus in a big way. His priesthood, his sacrificial atonement, as mentioned in Hebrews, its message truly is the heart of the Bible in Leviticus. Take a second and pray, shall we?
Lord, I don't, I don't know what you're going to do with your script this morning. What I do know is that I want it to be all about you and not about us. And that this power that has been given to us through the Holy Spirit, that it may move in such a way for transformation in the lives that you know that need that transformation. And can it happen through the book of Leviticus this morning? Even though it is 3,400 years old, Jesus, you say, I'm with you. I'm here to show you my power and might in a direct way through my word. Amen. This morning, the title that I wanted to start off with is Consider the Cost. All of life has a cost. You need to know that there's a cost of following Jesus, and one will determine, you will determine if it's worth it. That's a decision that you get to make. And the question that I have is, do I see God's laws when I read Leviticus? Do I see those as a requirement that I'm trying to maintain a duty or a burden? Or do I visualize them as grace, acceptance, a gift given by God that I didn't ask for? It's interesting that as the people reflected on it later, if you read Psalm 119, I would encourage you to do that. Longest Psalm in the Bible, and it's a big one, but read it. All through the psalm, they're talking about how they longed for them and delighted in God's laws. It's amazing how he blessed, how blessed are those who are, are blameless, who walk in the way of the Lord, who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. I thought, well, that's, that's quite something that the psalmist wrote that really and that God's people really and you'll see that as it unfolds it's like kids like you going to mom and dad saying you know what we we don't have enough rules we'd like some more rules can you give us some more rules more things we got to do because I just feel so loved and so blessed when you tell me what to do They are viewed as a guide to life, not a hindrance. Laws are not a way to salvation, yet an opportunity to enjoy your salvation. It's really a mind shift. So we recap. To enjoy the salvation that is important, to make sure it is on a firm foundation. Consider the cost. I, I like, you know I like props, so I brought some props. My dear wife made some props, because if you're going to have a foundation, I want them like that house, I want them built on a firm foundation. We'll see if this thing holds. I don't think it's gonna. Genesis. That's where we started. The first foundation. I'm gonna get a higher table one of these days. Genesis. In the beginning. And we got through the fact of the fall. And we got through the fact of of um, how God came and he, and he came alongside Adam and Eve. And we took that path, and it was a long path because Genesis covers a lot of time. And the verse, the key verse, we've talked about key verses, was out of Genesis 12, 1, when God went through the fall, and then he went through how he was going to step in, and he was going to replace man's sin because man was supposed to die, but he was going to replace that. And then we went on to the, the Cain and Abel and the blood, and we went on to uh, the flood, and then we went on to the Tower of Babel, and then we stepped out of there with the, the prophets and the establishment of the family. Genesis, beginnings. And then we moved on to Exodus. And the Exodus was huge, and it was great, because it was the fulfillment of the promise after 400 years, that long period that God spoke and said, I'm coming to get you. And the first half of that was God bringing the people out. But the second half of that was God stepping in in the tabernacle. It was a wonderful time when God came and it was a massive thing that they did, the size of a football field. And God made that so that he could dwell with the people. And now we get where we're headed. <laughs> people out of Egypt, God bringing himself in. The key verse there was 19, 4 through 6. And he said, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians. You've seen it. 
which is an incredible thing because as you get through the scriptures and we start working through you say well how do these people forget but they did Dennis Prager a Jew that I like to listen to is also a talk show person been on for years but he's, 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 he's really good in a lot of ways he said you know I I, and, and, and you got to understand, the Jew doesn't believe in Christ, so that's a, it's a little different aspect there. But still he says, you know, that God spoke to these people directly in very evident ways. We see that happen. He said, sometimes I'd be wondering if I, just, if I could hear God sneeze. Like if I would even sense that he's that close to me. And I don't know if any of you ever feel like that. Like, God, where are you in all this? Maybe like Job. Like CBS is studying Job. Like, God, where are you? Where are you? I've looked, I've, I've looked to the east, I've looked to the west, I've, I'm, I'm looking for you, where are you? Well, remember what I did to the Egyptians, God says in the key verse of Exodus 19, 4 through 6. He says, obey, keep my covenant, you shall, you shall, you shall be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. So that brings the question, now that God has moved into your tabernacle, he's moved into your neighborhood, that's what he's done. How are you to relate with him? Well, I'm curious if you can spot a time that you decided you wanted a relationship with a Savior. Like, okay, I, I believe I've made this. I don't know if I've made this decision in some way because I think it's a big challenge. I, I work with people all the time. Uh, I think R.C. Sproul said one out of 100 people can give really any kind of an acceptable description of what it is to be a follower of Christ. We can have a lot of religion, but no relationship. So God's moved in, and how are you going to relate to Him? How are you going to connect with Him? How are you going to hear Him sneeze? For many, I think it's Jesus hasn't moved into the neighborhood with Him. He's out there somewhere, or maybe a celestial bell hop, I don't know. And I hear about him, and I like to believe in him, but I don't know if I've really committed. I'm still on the fence in some ways. So how can we relate to him? We get a key of that in Leviticus. The Leviticus block. The key verse of Leviticus is 19.2, where God says, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. I don't know about you, but that presents a problem to me. Because first off, what's holy? Holy. Hmm. When I think of holy, what do you think of when you think of holy? Think of how how can one be holy? Exalted, righteous, divine, perfect. How many of you think you aren't perfect? Raise your hand. Yeah, I don't think I'm perfect. So if a description of holiness is perfection, that's never going to happen. And God says, yet yeah, you should be holy because I am holy. So this is a real challenge. And then God says, well, there's no one holy like me. I want to take pressure off you this morning. You know I'm big on that. You don't have to measure up. You're not going to measure up. And that's not what God meant by that. But there is something about holiness you need to know that I learned through this study. Holiness for the Christian is the difference maker. Science can claim how close humans are to animals. 99% DNA is a chimp as easy. Okay, well, so be it. But a chimp can't be holy. Atheists can be good moral people. You probably might know a few atheists that are actually morally better than some Christians you know. But an atheist can't be holy. You cannot be secular. You can't be of this world and be holy. You can't choose to be holy. You are chosen to be holy. 
As a Christian, you are holy by your relationship with Jesus. No different than the righteousness of the breastplate that you put on. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. It's not you, it's the righteousness of God that you put on. You are a member of a covenant community, irrespective of your obedience. It doesn't matter what your obedience is. And we realize that we're full of stuff, aren't we? That creates distance between us and God. Yet God provided an answer to the Israelites. He said, I'm going to take your unholiness and I'm going to put it on something, someone else. And it's going to cost something. There's a cost to it. Everything has a cost. All of life has a cost. He says, I'll provide a substitute, a sacrifice. I'll remove your sin and see you as holy. For those that remember, I took the film and talked about how when you take the film, and this has all our unholiness in it, all our imperfection, all the, all the things in life that are ugly that we don't like, and Jesus says, God says, I'll take that and I'll expose it. And if you know about the film, when you expose it, it's gone. Everything's gone. And Jesus says, that's what I'll do. I will make you holy. I'll see that no more. But the only way to be holy is through a sacrifice. I will set up the priest, he says in Leviticus, and to stand between you and me and to make sacrifices. They will be a mediator for your holiness before me. That's what Leviticus talks about. So the book opens, and we'll just go through them quickly, with five types of sacrifices. And I have come to realize in studying Leviticus that this is only an opening act for what is to come. It's a preparation. And it's a tough thing to talk through. But it's, it's, it's for the coming mediator, Jesus. It's a picture that God's giving to the people, the Israelite people, 3,500 years ago, to say in 1,500 years, I'm going to send a new sacrifice. And he'll be the ultimate sacrifice. But until then, this is what it's going to look like. And he was establishing a relationship with his people and setting up everyone's future. That's what he was doing way back then. He was setting up your future for today through the people. That's why he chose Abraham to say, I'm going to make a nation with you to be a witness to the world. Because the heart of the New Testament is the sacrifice of Christ, isn't it? The cross, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, all those things that we celebrate. That's the heart of Christ, the sacrifice that he gave for us. Well, the Old Testament, I want you to look at Leviticus, totally different. Leviticus is the Old Testament's cross of Christ. That's how important Leviticus is. The sacrificial book, the atonement book. Well, there was five kinds of offerings, and I just put them up there. Is it important to know? I think it's important to know. I struggled with this a little bit, but at youngsters and even adults that don't know, it's important to know that God doesn't do anything flippantly. He's very specific. And, and the reason that he had these was to establish with a relationship with others that, you know, sin is costly. Life is costly. Decisions you make are costly. Everything has a cost. So he starts off, and uh, just run through them quickly if you can see them. He starts off with the first offering, which is a burnt offering. And that offering, you could use a goat or a lamb or a pigeon or a turtle dove, and, but it must be the best of what you have. It can't be second rate. It's like, well, this one isn't going to make it. Besides, we're going to just we're going to get rid of it and burn it anyhow, so it doesn't matter. No, it has to be the best of what you have. And you bring it and you present it to the priest, and he takes it. And there was a perpetual fire that burned within this football-sized tabernacle, and 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 he would they would consume all the offering, and it was to show that the significance it was a sign as to how your sins, my sins, their sins would be consumed by God. Nothing you do. Bring your best. Present it to him. Offer it to him. Then the second one was a grain offering. Could be a big loaf, a little loaf, a pancake. It didn't matter. And what was different about that offering, part of it was burnt for God and given to God, and then part of it was burnt for the priests so they could have some because they had no sustenance outside of the sacrifices and what the people brought. And we'll see that. But not you. You didn't get any of that one. 
because it was to show that you are left with nothing. You come into this world with nothing, you've heard it, and you're going to leave this world with nothing. And so it's saying, the people were saying to God, everything I have, everything I am, everything I aspire to be, I give to you. It's yours. You have given it to me. And that's what the grain offering was for. And then number three was the peace offering of an unblemished animal, a spotless, the best of the herd. It is different. This one was different because some was offered to God, some was offered to the priests for, for them, and then you could join in this offering. And you could even invite friends into this one. And so it could, be, it could be a festive time of a peace offering. And then the fourth one was a sin offering. And the key to this one was the blood. We're not going to get real deep in the blood this week, but we will next week as we finish up Leviticus. We're just going to do it two times. The blood. The blood was sprinkled on the altar from the animal, and then some of it was poured out at the base of the altar, just showing out the pour out. And you've heard that in the New Testament. You've heard or you read how Christ's blood was poured out for us. This was making an atonement for our sin. It was to cleanse it, to purge it, to cover it. You see, only blood takes away my and your sin. And this becomes a very hard teaching. I did a sermon a while back. I didn't pull it out and reflect on it, but maybe it'd be worth again to say, why all the blood? Why all the blood? Leviticus 17.11 talks about the blood and how the blood, that life is in the blood. Adam, Adam sinned. He disobeyed God. Something had to die. He was supposed to die. God said, I'll replace it. He covered that with an animal skin. God cannot lie. God steps in and offers mercy, replaces our death with another so we can live. The fifth one was a guilt offering. One must make a payment of restitution to our God and others for offenses done. It's like, I got to make this right. That's why we have justice today. It, it, was very, <clears throat> it was very interesting. You can't have a society that has only justice. And you can't have a society that has only mercy. You have to have both. Think on that. The guilt offering. If you read the detail and the order and the preciseness of making an offering, if you read those in Leviticus, first five chapters, you're going to start to realize how complicated and costly it was for these people to bring offerings. It hurt them. It was a big deal. If you've made an offense to have to bring an offering for a guilt offering, to make things right, to bring justice to that person, it hurt. Every time, I said, think of this. Every time you offended someone, think of this. You had to, okay, pack it up. I got to go out. If you have animals, I got to find that prize bull. The one, the, the, one, the one that I just paid a ridiculous amount of money for because Neil told me to. And that's the one you got to take and present it as offering. It's like, okay, well, you offended your neighbor. You got to bring your car. Not your second car. Not the one that you drive occasionally. The best. The one that you just bought. That you paid too much money for. That's the car you got to bring. Your bike. Your favorite toy. Your nice jewelry. Not the jewelry you don't wear anymore that sits in the jewelry case. No, the one that you like to wear all the time. That's what you bring. Your offering has to hurt. There's a huge cost to it. There's got to be the deterrent, God said. Bring me your best stuff. There was a huge incentive for the Israelites not to sin. But what incentive do we have today? What's the cost? of our disobedience. There is one. There is a cost. I don't know if I recognize it always. God wants us to get the picture in Leviticus. Sin requires payment. Leviticus, though, it's wonderful. It's not about the act for us. 
It's about the lessons. It's not about the ball that they had to pick or the grain that they had to use or the turtle dove. It's not about that. It's about the lessons. How we can apply those to our lives today. I had to wonder, Randy, what's been the cost in your life for disobedience? Have you seen it? Have you been real? Have you been honest? It's an interesting thing. I deal with a lot of people. You know that. We're not good people of balance. You, you realize that too, I'm sure. Our pendulum swings pretty wide. So I deal with people who are super subjective or super objective. It's an interesting trait. Like it's always someone else's problem or it's always my fault. Very seldom is there a nice balance. I'm not sure I always see it. What the cost has been. Well, the cost for the priest was a little bit different because they had no stuff. <laughs> They're Levites. And it come from the Moses' brother, Aaron, and they all derived from that. And they derived their livings from the sacrifices. They were given no plot of land to develop as a livelihood. They were given land to live, but not where they would take it and farm it and till it and harvest it and raise animals for income. They had no inheritance. They didn't get any big bucks from their parents after uh, the Lord took them home. Joshua 18 says, uh, God says they will not receive an inheritance. And uh, God says to him in Numbers, I am your inheritance. I'm your inheritance. So maybe parents, I, I, I tease about this. Kids, you aren't going to like this. The Bible says that a wise man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So you might be skipped. If you can imagine being a Levite, no house, no cows, no goats, no chickens, no business, no car, no bike, no toys. All you have is God and the temple. That's it. That's all you got. And God says, that's enough for you. You don't need any more. That's enough. I'm enough. All this good reflection, you know, when you, when you get into it deep. It really is just so incredible. Because I say, oh, man, I'm not a young guy anymore. And as I look back on a lot of my life, a lot of my time was spent on seeking earthly material things. And I think I'm still learning. I know I'm still learning. That really my, true, my, my truest, greatest treasure is my inheritance and relationship with Jesus. There's just a joy that comes from that that I don't get from anything else. And I can't even put it to words, really. And I realized, you know, we all have the freedom to build any kind of house we want, any kind of lives. We all have that freedom. God's given us that freedom. And Jesus invites us. He says, hey, why don't you build on these things at last? Build on me. You're going to have a life that you're not going to believe. A full life, an abundant life, an overflowing life, excessive life. Because I've been around long enough to know, and I've read enough positive thinking books and all those good things that we can't get this true freedom from within ourselves. We can't get it from just suck it up. Come on, get it together, will you? Get a hold of yourself. You can do it. You're a winner. Be the best you now. Not going to last. That is fleeting. Matthew says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also Leviticus helped has helped me understand a little bit of what truly amazing grace is and I'm not sure I have a big enough view 
of the holiness of God and of my sinfulness, because life is pretty good, quite honestly. I'm not sure what I'd want to change. But Scripture seems to make it very clear when I read Leviticus that there's a big gap of how holy God is and how much I'm not. How He is exalted, how He is righteous, how He is divine and He is perfect. And that I'm in rough shape, quite honestly. John Newton, a former slave trader, you maybe know that, wrote Amazing Grace. When he was asked to sum up his life, he said, hmm, He is a great Savior, and I am a great sinner. I am so thankful that our God is compassionate, that He desires to bridge the gap, that He longs to forgive our sins. You know, it was 700 years how they had rebelled and rebelled and rebelled and rebelled. And God comes along and says in Isaiah to the people, He says, oh, I long to be gracious to you. I am so thankful He's long-suffering. I want justice too, but not when I perform the act. No matter who you are or how bad your week has been, God longs for you. I hope you know that this morning. I really do. It's been kind of a, this is a heavy book. You've got to admit, Leviticus is tough stuff. But God longs for you. That's the message of Leviticus. He cared enough about those people to go through that kind of complicated, I mean, it was a big deal. To present an offering, and I'll show you next week a little bit just on Tabernacle. I mean, it was a big deal. You read that. This wasn't a five-minute deal. It was a huge effort. It was a big cost to the people that did it and of the priests who performed it. And God, through all that, is saying, I long to be gracious to you. I long to have this relationship with you. God is compassionate. He desires to bridge that gap. And I know I've run into people who say, well, I don't know how God could possibly forgive me, how he could totally take everything away. And that's where I think I don't have a big enough picture of God's holiness and his ability to wipe all that out. And then there's some that think, well, I'm not that bad. I've run into that too. I'm a good person. I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I mean, why wouldn't God take me? I do want to encourage you. Know this. You're, you're no match for God. I'm no match for God. And thankfully... You don't have to go home today and give up your golf clubs or your car, your best car, or your bike or your favorite toy or your prize cow or, or even your iPhone. <laughs> you can keep that. But what we can do is confess, and he is faithful and righteous to forgive us, and he'll cleanse us, period, wipe it out. But if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I can't get over the message, and I don't know how to effectively do that. I love being on mountaintops, but Kent said it, you got to get down in the valley once in a while, and I don't know where to do that, but I know that... True change comes, true transformation, and Kent and I spoke on it, comes from repentance. It just does. That's how God works. I can't explain this God and why he works the way he does. And I may not even like everything that he says, but his truth is so consistent. His picture is so big that 3,500 years ago, he's, he's working with the Israelite people after he just got them out of the, the, the Egypt, 
and took care of all the Pharaoh's armies and whatnot to set up and say to you and I today that mattered. That was for you. Those were for you. Maybe some of us are thinking, I haven't even given my life to this Jesus yet. I can't remember ever asking him to come into my heart. So for those that might be with us, I'd like to lift us up this morning. And it's not difficult. In fact, you can do it right where you're at, in your chair, at home, wherever you are, in your car, wherever you are. It's about opening your heart and saying, I have sinned, Jesus. And I want God's sacrifice you in my life. And for some of us, maybe it's just a recommitment of putting Jesus first again. We've drifted a bit, and life's busyness has gotten in our way. You need to know there's a cost, though. If you want to do that, God wants something from you. In the Old Testament, it was a pleasing aroma. What God wants of you today, that pleasing aroma is a heart of worship. He wants your whole heart. Not just part of your heart. You see, you can offer that pleasing sacrifice just like they did then if you come with your heart. Because the heart's a sacrifice of a broken spirit that humbly we realize that he's God and we're not. End of story. And maybe that's all God wants from you today. It's your heart. For many of us. I know he does. And maybe that's all we have to offer. That's all we can give. Jesus, here's my heart. Please take my heart. Romans 12. Present yourselves a living sacrifice, being transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think here's what God would really love for me and you before we leave this building. He would love for us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, I'd like to take my life, and if there's others that would like to join me in this prayer and offer it up on the altar. Lord, I don't have a lamb, I don't have a dove, I don't have some grain. But I confess that I want too much of me and not enough of you. You see, I got great ideas, I got big plans of school and college and what I want to be in life, and, or maybe it's my next promotion or the next business idea. But Father, I've had my eyes on this certain person that I really want to get to know better and spend time with, this certain girl or this certain guy. Or there was this person that I really wanted to pattern my life after because they were so successful. But Jesus, I confess that maybe some of these things have been put before you. That, yeah, you live in my neighborhood, but I, I really don't come and see you very much. I don't spend much time with you because I'm busy. Jesus, I'd like to change that. 
that all these things that you have given me are not necessarily bad things, but when they come and step in front of you, they are worthless. And Lord, it's not worth the cost to me to lose my relationship with you to have whatever. Lord, am I willing to become a Levite where all I want is you and that my inheritance is sufficient with you? Amen. I want to tell you something. If you're able to say that prayer with me, I'll I'll guarantee you, your life will be different. That things will start to change and happen for you. Be aware. God is faithful. He keeps his promises.